get my notes straight now here before we get started. Again, thank you, John, for inviting me. Thank you, folks, for for having me and putting up with me. Uh, but it's always a, a privilege. I take it as a privilege to stand behind this sacred desk, behind this pulpit, and, and bring forth God's Word. Bring forth the message that uh, He has laid on my heart. And hopefully, prayerfully, you guys will receive it as it is intended. I love the song there. Mountains, it's time to move. And many times we have those in our lives that it seems like we're up against the wall or we've come up against the wall that we we can't get past it, we can't get around it. And Many times we just got to drop to our knees and say, Lord, move that wall. Get it out. Get it out of the way. And uh, move it out. Today we're going to be studying and looking at worship. Now, if you were to mention worship, to different people, to many different people, you would get many, many different responses onto what worship is all about. Uh, You may ask the pastor or the preacher, and he'd say, what is worship? And he'd say, it's that young man that sits in the corner there that's my amen corner. That was Dick Denini, if you remember Dick Denini up at First Church, he sat in that, that corner, and he had a booming voice. When he said amen, everybody knew it. Everybody knew it. So the preacher may say, it's that amen. You get that amen in the sermon. And a, a worship leader, they may say it's that song, that one that just brings heaven down, opens up the doors of heaven, brings it right into the sanctuary. And uh, you may ask some young people, what, what is worship all about? And they may say it's that beat. You know, you get into that beat. And that's, that, that starts to bring it out in the young people. Now, i got to tell a little bit of story here about, about the youth. I, I was a youth leader, a youth pastor for more years than I can even count sometimes. Or I wonder how I even got through it. <laughs> it's, it, uh, it was a long time, let's put it, but I loved every minute of it. But anyway, we were at an international youth convention with probably 3,000 young people. And... Uh, and we were, I don't know what city it was, I can't remember where we were, but it was in a huge room on the second story of a motel or something, convention center, and uh, the worship band came out. Now, you know, they've got drums and guitars, and sometimes it sounds like they have three sets of drums instead of one, but anyway, they're, they're into it. And the name of the song that they were singing, I think, was Jump for the Lord. And so they're getting into this beat and the kids are getting into it and they've got their hands in the air and and it's jump for the Lord and they're jumping. Well, I like to participate in worship. But you know, this this guy, this body was not made for jumping. Uh, And this was even 10 years ago or so whenever I was at this convention. That's I wrestled in high school. You know, the closer I could stay to the ground, the better off I was. So I've got my hand in, and I'm, you know, I'm going to fake jump. You know, like, okay, you know, everybody, the kids are just jumping. And all of a sudden, my feet are on the ground, you know, even though I look like I might be jumping. But all of a sudden, I feel the building, the floor, is when those kids are, you know, 3,000 kids jumping up in the air, and when they're coming down, that floor is starting to do this. And I'm up and down and up, up and down, and all of a sudden, it's like, wow, I had this vision of the floor collapsing. And here's all 3,000 or so of us just all ending up in, in the basement. Or, and, I, and so instead of worshiping, I, I had a spirit of fear that came over me. I wanted to run up front and grab the microphone and say, stop jumping. But you know, the good Lord, he got us through it. Those kids loved it. I mean, they, I, you, know, you know, they had so much energy. And that's what I loved about being with youth. The energy was endless. And it, it, and it was contagious, to say the least, as well. So I might have been not jumping in body, but in spirit, I was rising right up with them. So worship can mean many, many different things to different people. And, and, and what I found, it's not whether you jump 
or whether it's a type of music or what it is, the amen, but it's an attitude of the heart. It's the attitude that we come into the presence of God with to worship him. And today in our study, we're going to look at in the scriptures of two different types of worshipers. Uh, one worshiper is motivated by faith and the other is motivated out of self. And guess what? We're going to find these two types of worshipers very early on in our scriptures with Cain and Abel. With Cain and Abel, when they brought their offerings unto God, we'll see the difference in what they presented to God. One was accepted, and you all know, one was accepted and one was not. We're going to check into that a little bit further. But before we get into that scripture, before I give you the verse, I, I looked up what worship meant in Webster's Dictionary. <clears throat> and it kind of set me back a little bit about what worship is. And Webster explains worship this way. Worship is to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. Extravagant love and extreme submission. That is worship. And it's like, wow. That really puts a new light on what worship is about. It's not about jumping up in the air and, and banging your head off the walls or in, in the music or anything, but it's about the love that we express and about the submission that we give when we worship God. If you would, turn in your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 15. I'm going to read all those verses, but our, the main scripture we're going to be in is in the first, uh, first seven verses, but we'll read it all here. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And, the process, and in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why, have you con your con why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth and received your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on this earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out, of the, out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a, a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on his, him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Just to add a little note to that, when, when God was uh, punishing Cain for what he did, sending him out, what was Cain? Was Cain remorseful about killing his brother? Doesn't sound like it. He was worried about self. He said, oh my, someone will kill me now since you've driven me out, God. So he wasn't 
remorseful at all about what he had done. He was still continuing to worry about self. Cain was the first child ever born on this earth. The first child ever born on this earth. Can you imagine that? What an honor that would be. I'd make him really old. <laughs> but anyway, then, then along came Abel. Some commentators say that uh, they could have even been twins because, you know, God said, told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and fill the earth. So it would be understandable that they could have been possibly been twins uh, when Cain came first and then Adam, uh, then <clears throat> Abel came after that. You know, and in the Bible, oftentimes the names of the people have significance. Uh, and in this case, Cain and Abel, they both have uh, significance to their name. As we see here, when Eve bore Cain, she said, God has given me a man. God has given me a man. I don't know, but I've heard, I've read different things where it says that, that she possibly thought that this would be the the, the Savior, the one that would crush Satan's head. That she had given birth to the first male. And she was possibly thinking that this would be the one. This would be the chosen one that would crush Satan's head, as we find in Scripture. And, and, and in his name, that possibility could be there because Cain's name points to self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency to strength and power using an arm of flesh. So Cain means self, self-strength self-reliance um, you know he, he self-strength in, in our flesh had nothing didn't mention anything about God in this in this name but it was in his flesh and we can see that if you study the descendants of Cain you can see that Cain's descendants were known as builders of cities Nimrod was a descendant of Cain what did he do what was Nimrod famous for? Building the Tower of Babel and cities. So the, the descendants of Cain fall into that. They were also into the arts and brass and metal working, which constitutes into making of idols and idolatry. They raised cattle and, cattle and worked in the vineyards, you know, into alcohol. They were, in, they were uh, made musical instruments. Now that's a great thing, making musical instruments and what they did. But from what I've read, it led in, leads into the Hollywood group of people. You know, playing an instrument and singing is a wonderful thing. I wish I could. wish I could do that. But you do it for the Lord. There are so many that play their instruments and sing unto someone else, under, under the Satan, under the money, the concept of money. And the Hollywood crowd, well, you can believe every word they tell you because they're absolutely right. Just ask them, they'll tell you that, you know. So this is the descendant. If you wonder where they came from and where these concepts and this thinking came from, it came from Cain and his descendants. But on the other hand, we have Abel. Abel means empty nothingness and frailty standing for the simple life of faith Abel means just standing for that simple life not expecting anything not not having anything not not wanting to exert power but frailty and emptiness and nothingness and isn't that the way we have to receive the Lord don't we have to empty ourselves out to be filled you can't, you can't dump the Lord, you can't dump more water into a vessel that's already full. They won't accept it. Same way with the Lord. The Lord can't take over or go into someone that's full of themselves. You know, I always say that the trinity of me, myself, and I, something has to go before the Lord can come in and take over and feel that. But for the, Abel means for the simple life of faith, and righteousness. Look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They didn't depend on their own strength. They depended on God and his guidance. <clears throat> As we continue in this, there is no doubt that Cain and Abel had been taught by Adam and Eve 
how to worship God. How God was to be approached and how he was to be worshipped. Even at this time, even though they were outside of the Garden of Eden, God was apparently still meeting with them. Because we, we see it in this example. God did not accept Cain's offering, but he accepted Abel's offering. And it says, well, you're, when, when God said, I don't accept that Cain, it says his countenance fell. It's like all potty-faced or mad. Have you ever scolded a kid and said, you know, a, a, a child? And they just look down and they're mad, but yet they're determined to have their own way. That was Cain. It's like God said, this isn't acceptable. I can't accept this offering. It's not right. But he was mad because God didn't accept it. Like a little child. But he knew better. And have you ever had that stubborn child? You tell them no, but Esther's laughing because I know she raised some boys that were that way. That stubborn one that just, they want to do their own thing. I had one too that way. But yet, you love them and you bring them along. And that was what was so good about in verse 7 where God says, if you do, Cain, if you do, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Will you not be accepted? But now we see that Abel's offering was accepted and Cain's was not. Here we get into the meat of this. Why? Why was one accepted and one not? Well, in Hebrews 11, 4, it goes on to tell us why. It says, by faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain. Doesn't say anything about how good the sacrifice was, but it says by faith. Abel took the best that he had. He took the fattest sheep or, or goat or beef, whatever it was. He took the best that he had. And he offered it to God. He offered it to him. Not only was it the best, but it was given in faith. That this is what God expected. He was taught that this is what God expects is the best. And that is what he gave God. He gave him the very best that he had. Now what did Cain give to God? There, yes, Abel gave him the best that he had, and what did Cain give him? Remember, there are two ways to worship God that we said at the beginning, through self and through faith. And here I believe we find that Cain, Cain just worshiped God. It says that he, he, he got some crops from the field, fruit from the field. Scripture doesn't say he went out and gave him the first fruit. Have you ever... You know, I love all you guys very dearly here, but you know, if you ask for that first tomato off of my ripened vine, and you know, my tomato in the spring when they get ripe, it's like, I'm gonna, I don't know. You know, I love you dearly, but that first tomato. But it doesn't even say he gave him the first of his fruit of the vine. It just says he went out and he got some fruit. So apparently he just carelessly went out and gathered something up, thinking, okay, here we go, God, this is what I got you. Did you ever get a Christmas gift that someone says, well, it's not really what you wanted, but it's what I got you anyhow. <laughs> okay, I'll put it in the closet or in the basement. I'll re-gift it next year. But anyway, it's like he just went out and carelessly gathered up fruit. Not the first fruit, not the best fruit, not the finest fruit, not, not, not wonderful fruit, but he just went out and got some fruit of the vine and gave it to God. Carelessly giving God something that he knew wasn't correct. He knew that it wasn't right. He was taught better. Adam and Eve taught him better than that. Our scriptures. Anybody that reads their Bible and understands the word of God knows better than that as well nowadays. But we have so many people that are in the churches today that it's like, okay... I'll give you a wink and a nod. God, check it off my to-do list for Sunday and I'm on my way. I'm going to do my own thing. And you have, there you have it. There you have it. It seems that worshiping God for Cain was just showing up. He just came to make mom and dad happy. 
you know, here I am, Mom and Dad, you know, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, you know, man, how tough to have Adam and Eve for your mom and dad. They lived a long time. So, <laughs> so they, they, they would be have a watchful eye over you for a long time. But he just came to give God a wink and a nod, making mom and dad happy or to check it off his to-do list. He looked religious in his outward appearance, in his outward appearance, but failing to have a relationship with God, failing to make that connection with God through his offering and through his heart. What you offer outwardly is reflected in the heart inwardly. And his reflection, the reflection of his heart wasn't very good because he just grabbed something and gave it to God through self. <clears throat> Sadly, I believe that this is a condition of many Christians, or many, not, I won't say Christians, many churchgoers today. They want the God to accept them the way they are without changing without sacrificing anything. And it's very sad that there are preachers standing in pulpits such as this that are preaching to congregations and saying, God loves you. He's a God of love and he will take you right as you are. Did you get that? Right as you are. Well, let me tell you something. That's a lie. He won't take you right as you are because you've got to change he will accept you he will accept the murderer he will accept the thief he will accept sexually perverted he will accept you if you're lost but he won't take you in the condition that you're in you have to put on the altar of sacrifice the me myself and I and become emptied become hollowed out a little bit, at least a little bit. I know all of us weren't, when we accepted the Lord, we weren't completely empty. I know I wasn't because I still had, I was still me. But through time, through time, with that little place that we give God and He can come in and He can take root and He can start to move in your life and He can start to change you from the inside out then that infilling, it starts to begin. It begins and it begins to overwhelm and it begins to take over our whole being. And God can't change us unless we're willing to make, he can't take us unless we're willing to move. We have to be willing to give up and sacrifice that me, myself, and I. So when a preacher says that they will take, God will take you as you are, no, he'll take you where you're at. But you have to be willing to move and willing to change. He'll accept the sinner, but not the sin any longer. Not the sin any longer. And so many, from so many pulpits, preachers saying, God loves you. You can live that lifestyle that you want to live and still get to heaven. Still make your way with the Lord without changing I, I've never read that have any of you read that that you can go as you are without changing with God stay where you are and not change I've not read that repentance what does repentance mean turn from the way you were turn from the direction you were going and go in another way repent from your sins repent from your, your life from what you were, were doing <clears throat> The attitude of me, myself, and I has to be laid on the altar of sacrifice before we can move with Christ. And that goes for all of us, sinner and saint. Because God can't use us if we're putting our first self first. God can only use us if we accept him and understand that, that we need him to help us in, in our lives and in our daily walk. We can't stand at pulpits. John, you've done this. You, you preach. and All you that teach, 
It's like we can't stand in, in, in front of a, or behind a pulpit and stay where we are as individuals. We have to be emptied out and let the Holy Spirit start to well up in us and bring forth those words. We can't stay where we are and move with God. It's impossible. It's impossible. So many people want to keep their lifestyles and, and, and what they're doing in life. They like it. You know, sin, sinfulness, sin, sin's not a hated thing. People like their sin. That's why the churches aren't full. They like their alcohol. They like their sex. They like their drug. Now, many of them get caught up in it and they would just as soon not, but yet they don't want to empty themselves out enough to change, to go with God, because God, tell you what, God's the only way I'm here. It wasn't under the strength of Randy Hopper. It was because God gave me the strength to move forward and move out of the lifestyle that I was living. To move out of the life that I was living. Many commentators say that Cain's offering was not accepted because it wasn't a blood sacrifice. It wasn't a blood sacrifice. Well, perhaps that is true. But the one thing that I do know is that it takes a right heart to make the right sacrifice. So if Cain truly wanted to please God, he would have given him the right sacrifice. Whether it would have been crops, whether, whether it would be blood of an animal, whatever it was, it, took, it takes that right heart. That's where we are. That's what we are. We don't have to go sacrifice an animal to be brought into righteousness with God and praise God because Jesus is the one. He fulfilled that, that we don't have to. Because as a, as a pastor, I don't think that I could slay that many animals because it was, it was a bloody thing. It truly was a bloody, bloody thing for that blood of those animals to be sacrificed. We don't have to do that. Christ did that once and all for us. But truly, it takes, when we say, Lord, Lord, forgive me of my sins, it has to come from within the heart. It has to come, it has to well up from within our souls. And it has to take true meaning in our heads as it passes from our heart. I think we find so many people that, that can't move away from sinfulness because they just can't, they can't get that meaning, they can't get that to well up in their souls to where it takes hold in their brains and wants them and lets them move in into the Lord and into where they are in life or what they want in life. <clears throat> if Cain truly wanted to please God, he would have given him what was right. If you do what is right, God said, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? I love that. You know what that tells me? It doesn't matter how bad we have sunk, where we have gone, what, where we have slipped to in our lives. If we do what is right, will I not accept you? If you do what is right, will I not take you back? If you do what is right, will you not be a part of my kingdom? Those are wonderful words to hear. Because it doesn't shut the door. John, that doesn't shut the door on you, brother. No matter where we go. He'll take us back if we do what is right. And that, that is, re, you know, repentance. Turn from our sins and move forward with God. Now to wrap this all up. I know I said a lot of things and it's, it's in worship. Worship is a big subject. You could preach many Sundays on, on worship. Worship is not the emotional moving song that the worship leader requires sings. Worship is not the amount of money that is put into the offering plate or the amount of work that you do in the church. Those are acts of worship. Those are acts of And we are expected to do that. We're expected to work for the Lord. We're expected to, to do our part in his kingdom. I believe that God has provided enough workers, enough finances, enough, enough teachers, enough preachers to get his word out the way it needs to be done. 
But we in our own stubbornness sometimes we get in the way because that wasn't my idea. So we've got to get out of our own way so many times. I believe that worship is, is something that comes, true worship comes from the heart. Um, as we saw earlier, worship is to honor with extravagant love. To honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. That is true worship. And how do we get to that point? How do we get to that point? We ha it has to come from the heart. That's the only way we can worship God. The only way. We worship God simply because He is God. Period. Not so we will be blessed. You know, we got so many TV evangelists out there that if you know, if, if you come and worship God, you're going to be blessed. Ed, you're going to become a rich man if you keep coming here every Sunday and putting money in that tithe plate, brother. You will be blessed beyond you can even what you can even imagine. Is that why I come to church? Is that why I worship God so that I can receive, I can win the lottery? I'll become rich and famous. That's why I worship God. <laughs> Excuse me, I don't mean it. But anyway, yes, isn't that funny? I mean, I almost choked myself on that. <laughs> isn't that funny? We worship God because He's God, He deserves to be worshiped, period. Not so we will be blessed, not so we will become rich and famous, but because He deserves our worship. I'm going to tell a story that I've told before. Some of you may have heard it, heard it. Some of you may not. And it's not on you, John. John's out there. Look, he's got one eye up in the air. It's like, okay, what's he going to tell about me now? <laughs> no, it's not. This is, we'll bring a point home. There was a rich plantation owner man who owned an island somewhere off of the Caribbean and he had indentured slaves and slaves on this island doing his work for him and he would not allow the gospel to be spoken to any of the people that was on this island, any of the slaves or any of the people that were working for him. And if there happened to be a shipwreck on, that came to his island and there might have been a preacher or a priest or a, or a pastor or whatever, he kept them isolated, away from the population of the island, away from the people that he had in that island. And then he would soon get them off the island. As soon as he could, he'd get rid of those people. There were two young Moravian boys that had found out about this island and about this uh, plantation owner. And they sold themselves to this man so that they would be indentured slaves and would be kept on this island with these other people. And as they were had their bags packed or one bag or whatever it was and they were on the ship the parents were on the dock and the mothers were crying out why why have you done this and as the anchor was being lifted and the, the ship was slowly drifting away from the dock one of the young boys yelled out with a loud voice and said so that the lamb that was slain may receive the reward for his suffering. So why do we worship? Why do we come to church? So that Jesus Christ may receive his bride, his reward, the church. It's not about what we can gain. It's not about the jewels in our crown. It's not about a mansion on a hilltop. It's not about the streets lined with gold, even though I love all of those. It's not about that. It's about Jesus Christ receiving his bride, the church. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Father, for this, this message that came from Cain and Abel about worship, Father God. Lord, may we go from this place today and may we express our love to those that are around us, but most of all, may we express our love to you and our commitment to you, Father God. And as we wander this earth, or as we travel this earth, Father God, may we realize it's not about what we can get, but it's about what we can give. And it's giving of ourselves unto you, Father. It's giving ourselves that we may be worshipers, true worshipers, in spirit and in heart. Giving you the love and adoration that you so uh, deserve. And to give you, you, Father God, the respect that you also reserve, Father God. The submission of our hearts unto you. And we praise you, Father, for all you have done and all you will continue to do. Be with those that are lost, Lord. Be with those that are seeking. Be with those that are sitting in, in pews all across our nation, in churches that are hearing lies from the pulpit, Father God. May your word speak true to them. May it come to life. May they find out the truth of the words that are being spoken to them, Father God. We pray that their eyes would be open and their ears would be unstuffed. We ask, Lord, that you go with us. May we be, be the, uh, the people of God, giving you praise and glory and honor for all that you have done and all that you will continue to do. And we ask these things and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Where are we at, Thomas? Do we have a song?